So I'm George from Facebook. Uh, trust me, it's really George. It's just spelled differently. Uh, <laughs> I'm super excited today. First, I have such a great crowd. I'm, I'm first here for the first time on networking at scale. My background is electrical engineering, so I see probably a lot of folks from computer and science. Um, I'm also very, very privileged today to have a chance to speak on behalf of the whole Connectivity Lab on some of the really awesome stuff we're doing on uh, communication system design and technology development for on our mission to connect the world. So I want to big, uh, give a big uh, shout out to the whole Connectivity Lab team, a lot of smart people working diligently on connecting the world and building technology. I'm really just like a spokesman for the team. Uh, it still doesn't mean I'm a good speaker, so we'll come to that. So b before we start with the telegraph, I, I just want to give you a short introduction about what we do at Connectivity Lab and um, uh, how does this fit into a Facebook mission and then where does the telegraph fit into everything we do on, on, in our mission to connect the world. So uh, this is the slide from Mark's uh, keynote a few weeks ago. So he announced the 10-year uh, the goal for Facebook to give everyone the power to share anything with anyone. and he he basically presented the three main technologies that will actually uh, enable that uh, roadmap, and these are connectivity, artificial intelligence, and virtual augmented reality. So as you can tell, connectivity is an important part of, of our mission. So now, um, this is the world as we know it. It's basically uh, uh, people who have access to good quality internet with a, uh, this is a cellular picture of 4G LTE connections and 3G connections. However, the, the, the rest of the picture is much, much grimmer. So more than 4 billion people in the world have no access to internet, and a large portion of the remaining people actually has access only to poor quality 2G connections. So at Connectivity Lab, our mission is to really connect the unconnected and improve the experience of the underserved. So we're really targeting this population here. Connectivity Lab was launched a few years ago as a lab to develop technologies that will actually reduce the cost of internet infrastructure. Um, our mission is, was to actually improve things by order of magnitude so we can reduce the cost and reach populations where current solutions are not economically viable. We are not planning to uh, uh, run these networks by ourselves. We're going to develop technology, advance it to the level where it's basically economically viable for our partners and vendors to go and operate but we'll just make sure that the benefits that we bring actually translate to the, to the end, end people. So now let's look at the uh, technology side. Uh, 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 with the help of uh, data science and AI teams and Facebook, we, we quickly realized where the people live, right? So and we, we saw that uh, density population um, spans two orders of magnitude. So it's quite obvious that one solution doesn't fit you all. So to break up the problem, we identified uh, low density population, medium density population, and the high density population. In the medium to high density population, the main problem is really no connectivity. People just simply don't have anything to connect to. And this is where our solution is actually beaming the internet from the sky, from satellites, and the UAVs. Uh, on the high density population, which is anyway from the uh, dense urban, urban, uh, let's say up to the rural, there is connectivity, but the problem is the quality of connectivity is not, not good. So this is where we're actually focusing on the terrestrial side, and uh, we recently announced two projects there, the areas and the, and the telegraph. I'll be speaking about telegraph today. Uh, before we really dive into the uh, uh, telegraph, I just want to give you a, a, a little bit of picture how the, the systems works in, uh, in, in real world. So this is the part of our 96 element antenna uh, uh, for the areas project. It's basically high spectral efficiency, high energy efficiency system for future wireless communications. Uh, this is the microwave frequencies. Uh, free space optics links, uh, 10x improving throughput, let's say connecting the UVs above the weather. Uh, most of you have seen the picture of, the, uh, of our uh, uh, Aquila uh, airplane. It's a long endurance uh, solar panel, panel uh, plane. The wingspan is larger than 737. It flies above the weather, uh, 60,000 feet, let's say twice the height of the commercial air fleets. Finally, we also announced that we are launching some of the satellites for, uh, for the regions with a very low density population like, like Sub-Saharan Africa. That was for the Marks uh, uh, Press a few weeks ago. So that's about Connectivity Lab. Um, uh, we're now diving into the telegraph portion, which is the main part of my talk. So this is the outline. I'll first 
give you a perspective what is Terragraph and now also give you a little bit hint about what are the technical challenges that we run into where we're de developing the system. I will highlight a couple of the breakthroughs and then we'll actually wrap up with some of the performance. So what is really a Terragraph? As we already seen, it's a, it's a terrestrial solution for high-speed internet connectivity in dense urban areas. It's a 60 gigahertz uh, multi-node wireless distribution network. It's optimized for high volume. Uh, it's utilizing off-the-shelf uh, VIGIC uh, components. It's leveraging the cloud for intensive data processing and the self-organizing network. And the core part of the system designed for ease of installation and multi-node stream furniture. So that's also very important for us uh, when we talk about street furniture, we think about uh, lamp posts, uh, traffic lights. So uh, when you de develop a system, a wireless system of this scale, it's always the, uh, difficult to find places to mount it. And um, uh, we're actually looking at ways that with the one, uh, one license, we can actually get access to a lot of street furniture in the streets. Um, so this is how our um, uh, network works, the looks and when deployed on the street level. So we really have two uh, types of nodes. We have the distribution nodes, which are mounted, let's say in this case, on the, on the lamppost. They have anywhere from two to four radio sectors, and they form our basic trunking topology. So basically, that's the core of the network, uh, distribution network. Then on top of that, we have client nodes, which are mounted typically on the side of the streets, and they are single radio sectors, which connect to the distribution nodes on one side. On the other side, they provide internet, either for Wi-Fi access points, for cell or small cells or just for internet for the, for the end user at the, or, the, or the curve of the building. Um, so now why building a new system? You know, what's wrong with, uh, with existing solutions uh, for the last mile distribution of the internet? So we, we looked at uh, what's there and you know, we identified the usual suspects. You know, we have copper, uh, fiber, and a cellar. So let, let's go one by one. Uh, copper, limited bandwidth. That's your, your, your DSL cable modem. At some point you run out of speed. Uh, fiber is great. It really offers several megabits per second uh, to meet this uh, multi gigabit demand. It's present in many places. It's just not present where people need it. So how to get pe uh, fiber to the end user? You need to dig the streets. You need to uh, put uh, uh, optical cables. It's not really practical. It's very expensive to do it in the urban areas and high density urban areas. So we pass on that. Uh, finally, cellar. It has a great technology potential but it's dependent by lack of spectrum. Most of current cellular systems, they operate in licensed bands. The spectrum is not available, it's expensive. It's just not, not enough spectrum to meet this high demand. So we, we are engineers, we like to think about orders of magnitude, so we ask ourselves, can we really, we really build a system which has a fiber speeds, but it basically deploys and operates at a fraction of the cost? And that's how we came up with Terragraph. So I just want to give you a little bit, uh, let's zoom into the spectrum because we identify spectrum as an important aspect of what we do. This is the US radio spectrum location, anywhere from three kilohertz on one corner all the way to 300 gigahertz on the other side. This is a logarithmic scale. Uh, so basically every row is basically has, is one decade. So the first row is three kilohertz to 30 kilohertz and then second row is 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz, so forth and so forth. So basically you come to the last row which is 30 gigahertz to, uh, to 300 gigahertz. This is really important spectrum. This is where most of the current integrated uh, circuit research is, is ongoing today in the world. And this is basically the most promising part of the spectrum for future high data rate communications. Um, so um, why is that important? Because there's a bundles of, of spectrum in that area. And there are already systems which operate in this area and most of them are actually licensed. So you have, for example, KA band, which is anywhere from 26.5 to 40 gigahertz, uh, which is used for commercial satellite systems. You have E band on the other side, 70 to 90 gigahertz, which is uh, available for fixed wireless uh, outdoors. You have um, uh, 28 and 38 gigahertz, which are now being uh, eyeballed and, and for, uh, for the 5G cellular. Uh, you have 77 gigahertz, for example, vehicle radar. And then there's this important part, which is 60 gigahertz. So out of all the spectrum millimeter wave, 60 gigahertz is, uh, is basically unlicensed today. And we will go back later into propagation and we'll give you a little bit, uh, you know, uh, hints why it's actually turned out to be unlicensed. Uh, what is very important is that because this is a logarithmic scale, if I put things in perspective and you look at all the spectrum which you use today in your everyday life for AM, FM radio, for all of your cellular from 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, uh, all of your uh, TV broadcast, 
Wi-Fi, you know, 2.45 gigahertz ISM band. You take all this together, and you actually have less spectrum that is available in this 60 gigahertz unlicensed band. So it's really awesome. Uh, another view to the thing is that if you look at the LT today, let's say release 11, 12, which is not even in your phones yet, uh, typical system band is 20 megahertz, but you can do carrier aggregation. You can get up to five carriers, so you're looking at maximum 100 megahertz. In 60 gigahertz, there are three or four channels, depending on the, the side of the world, which each is two gigahertz wide. So today, we are already using 20 times more spectrum than is actually LT we we'll ever use uh, uh, when it basically comes to its fruition. So that's the spectrum picture. That's when we part, when part side. Uh, again, we'll come back to 60 gigahertz and why is it unlicensed later. Now, millimeter waves, first of all, this last row was a millimeter wave. Uh, why is it millimeter wave? Because simply, uh, if you do the math from 30 to 300 gigahertz, the wavelets are anyway from one to 10 millimeters. That's very important later when we come to antenna design. So um, it's the most promising enable for future wireless communications, and what's also important that uh, several uh, uh, industrial standardization efforts already kicked in that area, and uh, the most important one is basically Vigig on A211 AD, which is basically continuation of the A211 AC family that you know, all you're probably familiar with. And uh, as a result of that, we're already seeing actually chip chips off uh, on the market from both Blazeman and RFIC, which are designed for this standard. Now, that's very important because we don't want to build, start building chips. We want to actually use that rich ecosystem and put in perspective of the of future communication design. So uh, now the challenges. So uh, these are the main, main ones that we are actually run into. First of all, the 60 gigahertz of band is, is deemed unsuitable for outdoor communications due to high oxygen absorption, rain fade, and tree attenuation. If you remember the picture from the previous slide, it was giving a use case for 11 AD, which is the short range indoor communication. You're sitting indoors, you're beaming to your TV at high data rates, and those systems are really designed to complement existing 11 ACNN, where you basically have a coverage, a nominal data rate with 11 ACNN, and then opportunistically, when you're close to your, your device, you can actually beam at very high power and very high speed. So now we're putting that and we're actually going outside and we're trying to uh, apply this to outdoor communications and, and bridge the long range. So that's the, that was the first challenge. Second challenge is that uh, uh, it was a layer two protocol uh, for Mac in the CSMA as, as all the other 11N protocols, it actually relies on CSMA and uh, it, which actually has very poor efficiency in multi-hop networks. Finally, we actually run into lack of uh, easily external routing protocols for fast link recovery in the large multiple wireless networks. So now let's look at the, at the band that nobody wanted. That was the 60, 60 gigahertz band. So this equation basically describes pretty much any uh, uh, wireless uh, propagation in, with any frequency. So PR and PTR uh, receive and transmit power uh, as measured milliwatts. This is a logarithmic domain, so it's basically DBM. Just to calibrate. Uh, this system typically emit anywhere around 43 dBm, so that's about 20 watt. So uh, this is the transmitter receive power, and then what happens in between, we'll skip just for a second, the GR and GT is all these negative terms. They're negative because they, they attenuate your signal. They basically reduce the energy as the signal comes from transmitter to the receiver. So the first one is the free space propagation loss. What we see there is that energy drops as a, is, as a square in proportion to the distance between transmitter and the receiver as well as, as a function of the frequency. So as you go to the higher frequencies, actually there's more propagation loss, right? Just the free space uh, propagation loss. And then we have several terms on the right uh, uh, side, which is also negative. You can group them in a different way, but we group them in a way to em emphasize the importance that it has to, to 60 gigahertz of propagation. First one is oxygen absorption. Second one is the rain. And the third one is general fading propagation, which is no anyway from reflections or foliage, going through foliage. Again, uh, diffraction is not what we have at 60 gigahertz, which you don't normally, know it, uh, normally have at the microwaves. So now let's go uh, one by one. Now this picture is really telling uh, why is this the band that nobody wanted. So if you look on the right, this is basically oxygen absorption as a function of frequency. So there's this huge peak, which picks up somewhere around 42 all the way to 57 gigahertz, where basically oxygen abs absorption grows from 1 dB per kilometer to 15 dB per kilometer and comes back. So what's really happening there, this, I mean, linear scale, 98% of energy actually gets absorbed over one kilometer of, of propagation. 
So uh, if, apparently this phenomenon is well known and the physicists actually already explained it. Uh, it was due to a, a Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Mount Black, who actually unveiled this back in 1947 in his paper. Uh, the oxygen is, 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 a, is a paramagnetic, so it means it's a magnetic dipole. And in general, magnetic dipoles actually has much less absorption of electromagnetic energy than uh, ele electronic dipoles. However, that's true unless you hit them with their resonating frequency. And it turns out for, for oxygen molecules, the resonating frequency is at 60 gigahertz, so it's just out of luck. <laughs> so uh, what it means is basically as the electromagnetic waves go through the air, it hits the oxygen molecules, and the electrons actually move in the same electron state. They resonate, they absorb the energy. So what can we do? We can actually license all of the spectrum and then give the 60 gigahertz for anybody who can try to do something with it, right? It's a scrap band, so you know, let's see how people are innovative to, to do something with it. So that was actually a challenge for us. And uh, uh, there are other, other components here. I didn't mention the rain. So for example, it's, it, it's even dimmer. Uh, uh, oxygen is 15 dB per kilometer. And then the rain in some parts of the, of the world can be even 20 dB per, per, per kilometer. And that's what you don't have in the indoors when you build a system for indoor communication. So how can we solve the problem? We cannot actually take the, the, the terms on the, on, the, on the right, which are negative, because this is purely physics, right? We can't do anything there. But we can do something with the PT, GT, and GR. Now, what are those? PT only says the transmit power. We have some limits there at the end of the day, because there are regulations. You cannot transmit power obnoxiously. At some point, you have to stop. However, the GT and GR are degrees of freedom. Uh, this is a transmit and receive array gain. So now we'll zoom into that and how we actually use that as a force in the vehicle to, to reach this large distance that, that we're talking about. So here's the picture, three man picture of typical uh, adaptive antenna array response. We use a smart antennas, they're also called adaptive antenna or serial antennas. Uh, so we use them on both sides of the link, and the picture here is a 3D response. So every adaptive antenna array has a direction which is, is the main flow energy which is basically the desired part of emission. And then the peak of that emission is simply your area gain, right? If you slice this uh, pattern in a, a vertical uh, horizontal domain, you can actually also identify the angle at which energy falls by, by 3 dB or by half. And that's also known as half power beam it. Now, half power beam is a crucial measure of how focused is your antenna. As you have adaptive antenna area with more elements, the half power beam actually gets smaller, which may basically means that this side low becomes thinner and, and higher, right? So you have more gain, which is one thing. You can actually close the link to this receiver. Equally important, the energy is more focused in the space, so there's less interference to everybody else, right? So again, reverse is true on the receiver side. I can point to my transmitter. I can get most energy from my desired transmitter. I can basically filter out interference from the undesired transmitters. There are also these uh, uh, hair wires here, which are basically uh, 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 minor, minor lobes. Uh, this is basically uh, unwanted uh, emission of energy, and um, uh, basically also potential for interference. But those minor lobes are appreciably lower than uh, the main lobe. And then you also have the nulls, which is basically anything in between, which just take away as, a, as a something you can use as a degree of freedom to optimize for interference as you do steering. Again, minor lobes are typically smaller than the main lobe, but you have to do it right. If you don't do antenna design properly, you actually get grating lobes, and these are as good, as high as your, as your main, main beam. OK, so next thing is, uh, so what do we do with that? Uh, they're all dividing chips built for short range of communication. So we actually partner with, with chip and antenna vendors, and we actually build this new transceiver uh, uh, architectures based on Y-Gig, which actually serve a large number of antennas. And with that, we actually get a good high, high antenna gain. We can steer the energy. We can reduce the interference. We can bridge that gap and actually close the link at large distance. So just to give you some numbers, our box is around, let's say, diameter of 20 centimeters. And at 60 gigahertz, if you go back, the wavelength is around 5 millimeters. And your antenna is typically directly proportional to the wavelength. So on a 20 diameter box, you can really put a lot of antennas, right? Now, the challenge is that to bridge the gap from the RFIC to antenna, there's a lot of tracing and transitions, and there's a lot of places where actually you can lose the energy. So if you don't do it right, it can be a wash. So everything that you invest in the antenna actually can be lost in that transition from the RF to, to the antenna. So it requires careful design and also innovation. Uh, now, notice what is happening here. This beam actually just moved right by some degrees. 
like 35, 40 degrees. So that's called beam steering. So apart from having focus and energy, we also basically need the ability that we can actually change the angle and steer that beam. That steering happens through software, and at the time we, are, we, don't, uh, we announced the project, we're actually be able to switch and, and steer these beams with less than eight microseconds, and there's much more room for improvement. Uh, important for us, uh, uh, first of all, operate on a street level, and we are also point to multipoint systems, so we switch between them in time domain fashion. On top of that, we need to optimize optimal steering to maximize the signal, receive signal and minimize interference. React to changes in the propagation environment. Every now and then, street level and the low, low height, the bus goes through. We need to quickly reroute and find an alternative path, propagation path, let's say rely on the thing and close the link. So all that is done by software and very, very fast. The value is that, if you remember the beginning, I said uh, uh, installation, uh, basically the, the here you basically just slap the box on the side, it automatically finds the best routes and connect the link. Now, that's a picture from my daughter. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, how many of you are familiar with the, uh, we are going one layer up, right? We discussed, uh, we discussed the antenna and then we kind of skipped to layer one because we're getting chips from, from uh, modifying something there. Now, that's the second thing. So layer two is actually where it also made changes. Device multiple access which is highly inefficient for multi-hop, multi-point networks. Uh, for, for all of you actually, for familiar wire networks, we have collision detection. In wireless, we cannot do collision and avoidance. At least for now, until the, you know, the full duplex radio are commercialized, it's always collision avoidance. But in nutshell, it's very similar. So, you know, if you explain this to, a, to my 10-year-old daughter, how does it work? We, we are sitting around the table, and everybody's talking, and we are waiting for for speaker to stop, so we find that pause, and then we actually start you know, talking in that pause. And, but every now and then we cut into each other, and then we kind of back off, and we wait for another chance. And you know, few who are you know, um, few also apologize by doing that. And uh, but that's how things work, right? Now imagine you have all this full room of people; everybody wants to try to talk at the same time using the same medium. It won't work, right? And it's in fact it's very well known for CSMA. When the number of clients is large and the overload to the system is low, the efficiency of the layer two is, is, is actually uh, reduced. Although, in nutshell, it's a very good distributed protocol, it doesn't really scale. So, another problem with the CSMA is that on the, on the multi hop networks, basically increases the prob probability for TCP throttling, and it's actually not very easy to guarantee delay. So, what we did basically is uh, we kind of stripped off that CSMA MAC and we built our own custom MAC which is based on the TDD TDMA, and it's fully scheduled MAC. And uh, on top of that, we have a number of protocols for directional beam forming training, blind link acquisition, we have interference management. And with all this, we actually saw uh, about 6x improvement in network, network efficiency. And we're able actually to, to, uh, to avoid TCP throttling and to also guarantee the latency in the system. Latency is very important. Uh, now, moving up to food chain on layer three, uh, that's another thing we touched. Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that we couldn't find extendable uh, uh, layer 3 uh, protocols for, for large multi hop networks. And we're really fortunate here in, in Facebook Connectivity Lab. Connectivity Lab is a part of the uh, uh, broader infrastructure team, and these are the folks here who really build and run one of the largest networks in the world. So we partner with them, and this is where we actually work together. This mechanical meets CS and we're actually building something good for everyone. Uh, Peter is talking about OpenR, which is our new uh, protocol in the afternoon. I don't want to steal his team. I want to say much about it. It's basically, uh, it's basically uh, a protocol which combines in-network autonomous functions with centralized control logic for computing optimal traffic engineer paths in the cloud. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, Facebook data center infrastructure innovation that goes into that. It's all IPv6 layer three routing optimized for, for uh, fast link recovery and low latency. Now we have enough tools to kind of come back to the street level and see how we use them and what was really happening there. So again, there's a fiber photon presence here and we're not going to dig streets here because we don't want to trench cables. We're going to position those distribution nodes on the lampposts and all these blue links, these are actually your beamform links so you can see very narrow energy and they're all transmitting at the same time, on the same frequency at the same time. Why is that possible? Because I can steer the beam, I can deliver the energy to the desired receiver, I can avoid actually interfering for the, for the other. So that's the core of network, that's the trunking topology, which has a lot of diversity. 
And then on top of that, we have these fan outs. We have basically connections to the side of the building where we offer internet. And there, in some cases, you can uh, also have the Wi-Fi or sell our small cells or internet connections. Now, those client nodes, uh, if they're served from the same uh, distribution radio sector, then basically we have time domain uh, multiplexing. We're able to switch beams very efficiently. And it's very important that you can do it very fast because otherwise there's an overhead uh, in, in doing that. Now, uh, let's look at the bus there, see what's going on there. So let's say we have that link between two uh, DN sectors. Suddenly, double-decker bus comes through. Uh, the system is smart to detect the failure and automatically actually reroute on the link level. And in this case, basically run the reflection on the nearby building to close the link. In case where there are no alternative routes to close the link, again, we rely on a fast layer recovery from the layer three and, 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 and routing. A cloud architecture is very important for us. It's, it's basically inherent part of the network architecture of the telegraph. So we actually have an end-to-end -end controller which is sitting on a cloud. It's co-located with our data centers. Uh, the main, main reason we have it is basically that that's the actually brain of the system which provides the self-organizing uh, network aspect of the network. Uh, again, key aspect for us is that networks have to operate to reduce the OPEX. They have to be smart and operate and maintain by themselves. And uh, there are two reasons we have a controller on the cloud. One is that we want to exploit that bird's eye view of the network. We want to collect a lot of uh, statistics and we do data, data analytics and anomaly detection. On the other side, we also want to pull the complexity out of the network because all the boxes on, on the street level have to be, they have to be inexpensive uh, uh, and there's so much limited uh, software processing power. So we actually try to anything which is not real-time processing we try to actually pull back to the cloud, and we actually do it on end-to-end -end controller. So we do dynamic recommendation of the network resources. We do optimum transport resource utilization to simplify network planning, deployment, and operation. And then that's a basic breakdown of the architecture. You have the control plane in the data centers. You have regular internet, and that's basically our transport network, which consists of the distribution and client nodes. Uh, now, some results. Uh, we announced this a few weeks ago, and these are pictures. If you walk through the campus, you actually see these lampposts with these uh, uh, boxes on the left and right. So we deployed uh, our telegraph here in the MPK in the courtyard. It was actually a perfect street, which mimics the dense urban environment with the buildings and lampposts. It was a really good playground. And this is where we optimize our system. This is where we basically build the system. So. Um, at the time we announced, we basically were measuring uh, one of five gigabits per second in bidirectional link, which means if you look at the point to point, it's basically 2.1 gigabits per second in and out of, of a given uh, sector. And if you, let's say, put four sectors on one lamppost, this is a total throughput of, of 8.4 gigabits per second. We think that number can actually go to 12.8. Distances, anyway, from two to 200 meter, meters. Uh, this is where the beam forming really plays the, plays the crucial role. So uh, now what do we do with that, right? Uh, we want area to be open, uh, much like we did for data center technology where we actually contributed to the open compute project. Everything that we do at Connectivity Lab, we basically try to iterate in a way that basically become open. We develop technology, and then our plan is actually to contribute it as a part of the telco infrastructure project. So we are connecting the world, making it more open. With that, I conclude my talk. Thanks, everyone. All right, there've got to be some questions because I know when I first saw this, you know, last year, I had a lot of questions. So, um, mics, the mics, uh, folks are running around. Thank you. Who's got a mic? Who's Raise your hand if you've got a question. There, here we go. I'm wondering if you deal at all with uh, mobility management, because cellular networks, a big part of the work they do is really mobility management, so you can walk around. I'm wondering if you have any support for that. If people walk around, they, they keep connectivity, or they don't reconnect on every time if they switch from one Wi-Fi to the next? Yeah, this is part that is basically complementing our network. We are building really the distribution network with the core tracking topology of network. What you put on top of it is the number of wireless access points. You can still build your controller and have all that mobility in the network. Nothing prevents that. Yeah. Uh, 
I already have the token, so. So basically, the general understanding that I got is you're implementing something similar to LTU, but in 60 gigahertz, so you have a DDD and goes all on top of it. Uh, what happens when eventually other people pull on LTU and start invading 60 gigahertz? What, what steps are you taking to prevent them into jumping yes. into your timeline? It's a beam forming. Uh, there are combination effects. Again, uh, uh, Viking has up to four different channels. So currently, we're occupying only one channel. It's a single frequency network. So you can change the channel. On top of that, we have beam forming, which can optimize for interference and, and avoid interference. Got one right here. I just have a question on the, op the oxygen absorption rate yes. and how that uh, affects. Does that only affect throughput? Um, it does affect the capacity. Basically, you have so much power, so the energy that reaches the other side of the link reduces your link budget, therefore the capacity you can push through is reduced. And the second question, forgive me if this is ignorant, but in, in areas where you want to do this in highly dense uh, populations where ozone issues and whatnot, is right. there any uh, skepticism from like city governments on the effect of having all these, I mean, forgive me the dumb question, but effects on just the environment with the absorption of the oxygen? I don't know, stupid question, but. Um, you can yes, just say we, no. We, <laughs> Uh, obviously, yes, we are affected by smog, by, uh, by the humidity, we are affected by the rain, we are affected by oxygen. So that's all part of the link budget that we account for when we're actually trying to close the link. So now impact to the actual environment, if you think about impact to the humans, that's basically already regulated in 11 AD. So, uh, yeah, so we are complying to those standards, yeah. I think we got one more question yeah. here. So I had a quick question. Uh, have you considered using five gig radios in addition to uh, the 60 gig? I mean, do you think that the off-the-shelf 60 gigs will solve your reliability problem, even with all the beam forming? It's an excellent question. Uh, uh, something to think about in the future. Uh, at this point, we are solving this problem, which is really the 60 gigahertz network. We believe we can solve and get good reliability with that and then offer the 5 gigahertz to the last, uh, last mile access to the end user on the, on the street level. All right, so please help me thank uh, George. All right.